There is nothing worth living for unless it is worth dying for. My grandmother lived a life devoted to Jesus, and today her talks have been made available in their original form. So you too can be built up through the insights and mysteries God revealed to her throughout her ministry. Now, without further ado, here is Elizabeth Elliot. I mentioned last night I'm centering my remarks around confidence in God. Nobody is going to be willing to trust somebody else in whom he has not confidence, nor are we going to obey. So to me it is of paramount importance that we have very clearly defined in our own minds where our confidence lies. Does it lie in results, circumstances, events, answers to prayer, our own spirituality. Many years ago, I had the great privilege of visiting a beautiful sheep farm up in the northern mountains of Wales, a place called Shana Maudwi. And a very beautiful, misty summer morning, I stood in the bedroom window of the farmhouse of the shepherd and his wife, while his wife explained to me what the shepherd was doing. As we looked out the window, we could see what looked like a, a rug just sliding slowly down this velvety green mountainside. Well, the rug, of course, was a huge flock of sheep, and I could see them in the distance moving down. And as they got down to close to where the shepherd was, he was on horseback with his black and white dog, Mac. I could see Mac circling wildly around the left side of the flock and then suddenly he would stop on a dime and then he would back up and he would circle around the right side and then he would go after one sheep that had separated from the flock and he was doing all these amazing things and the way that dog could stop and he was just crouched there with eyes blazing and you could I could tell even from the the window that he never took his eyes off those sheep so of course I wanted to know how does the dog know what to do? Well, she said, you can't hear it, but John has a whistle that only the dog's ear can hear, and he is obeying his master. And it was very obvious to me that what I was seeing there that morning was not only a shepherd whose care for the sheep was probably the most important thing in his life, except for love for God, but I also saw a beautiful illustration of the loyalty and obedience of an animal who obviously lived to please his master. Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. And then I watched as they took the sheep all the way across the pasture that was behind the farmhouse and then over to the pens where Mari, the wife, told me that he had to dip the sheep. This was the day for dipping. Now, I realize that I'm in very rural country here, and you know all about sheep. We don't know anything about them back in the East. It's very rare to see a sheep. Maybe people have three or four just for fun, you know, in New England, but there's no wild open spaces left there. But I didn't know anything about dipping sheep, and so it was wonderful to me to watch the dogs separate the, the rams that were to be dipped first from the ewes and the ewes from the lambs, and he got them all into the proper pens, and then I stood and watched, and there was this great deep pit, sort of a, a bath of black, horrible-smelling liquid. And I watched as the shepherd grabbed the horns of these sheep and just flung the rams into this horrible-smelling stuff. And, of course, the poor animals struggled and spluttered and came up and tried to get out, And whereupon... Mac, the dog, had taken up his place beside the sheep dip and nipped at their faces if they came, if they tried to come out. Well, there was a uh, incline at the end, and so eventually, after the shepherd had not only taken a an implement and shoved their f heads down under the water two or three times, and Mac had snapped at them, so they had go had to go under two or three times. They finally struggled out at the other end, and then I watched this. He took them again down into a further pasture, and I again watched this wonderful coordination of obedience and trust. The trust was so obvious, the dog knew his master. And I turned to Mari and I said, does the dog know what the shepherd is up to? And she looked at me and she said, the dog 
doesn't understand the pattern, only obedience. It says in Romans 8.28, everything that happens fits into a pattern for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. I couldn't tell you how many times people have said to me, I don't see how this terrible thing that has happened in our lives has anything to do with the will of God. Are you going to tell me that this horrible thing, and I heard a horror story last night that's right up there at the top with all the other horror stories that I've heard. Am I going to tell them that this was God's will, that that thing should happen? Did God ordain that? Well, of course, in my own experience, do I say, did God ordain Did God cause savage Indians to spear five missionaries to death? Was that God's idea? Did God allow it to happen? I don't think it's so difficult for us to answer the question that God did allow it to happen. We have to remember, if God was small enough to be understood, he would not be big enough to be worshipped. We don't have to understand the pattern. Only what? The dog doesn't understand the pattern, only obedience. The dog heard the whistle, the dog did exactly what the master said. The results of the dog's obedience, he didn't have the foggiest notion what it was all about. He didn't know why the sheep had to go into the sheep dip. He didn't know why the shepherd wanted him on the right side of the flock one minute and on the left side of the flock the other. He didn't know why he was told to stop and come back. All he did was the next thing. Whatever the master told him, that was his meat and drink, and that was his freedom. So here was a picture of marvelous freedom that comes out of obedience. Now you know perfectly well that there would be no freedom on a freeway if most of the people, most of the time, didn't keep the laws. You would never be able to travel at high speed in one direction without interruption if most people didn't keep the laws. And if one person doesn't, there's trouble. So that's what freedom is all about. Now, the world says freedom is doing my own thing and nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm going to do what I want to do and I'm going to do what I want to do when I want to do it. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. That's not freedom at all. That's bondage. Jesus said, if you continue in my words, then you are my disciple. And the truth, and then you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. But the That freedom lies on the far side of obedience. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. The master's truth made the dog free. And during the day when the dog was back in his pen with the rest of the sheep dogs, every time that master went by the gate of the pen, those dogs were just so excited and their eyes were fixed on him. They were just dying to do his will again. They couldn't wait to get out there. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had that attitude of obedience to the Lord? The foundation of our confidence, if you want a title for this morning's talk, that's it. The foundation is the character of God. Not what God does primarily, it's who God is. And in Isaiah 43, a chapter from which I quoted last night, that wonderful verse that the Lord comforted me with when I learned that my husband was missing, the first verse in the chapter says, Now this is what the Lord says, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, For I have redeemed you, I have summoned you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, the flames will not set you ablaze, for I am the Lord your God. And that is the peg on which I hang my soul. I am the Lord your God. You remember when Moses complained to the Lord that Pharaoh would not listen to him and that the people of Israel would not listen to him. Why should they listen to him? Who shall I tell them sent me? You remember the Lord's answer. Just tell them, 
I am sent you. That's who he is. The dog knew his master. He trusted his word. He did what he said. And that's all he had to do. And that is all, ladies and gentlemen, that is required of you and me. That we know him, that we trust him, that we do what he says. He says, if you love me, do what I say. And you children who are being raised in Christian families, thank God that you have parents who want you to do what they say. And of course, when your mother or your father says no, you may not have another popsicle. It's almost supper time. They say that because they hate you, right? <laughs> they really don't like you. They don't want you to, be, to enjoy another popsicle. Well, there's a smart boy on the front row who's shaking his head. He knows that's not the reason. But then, of course, the response of a whole lot of kids would be, you never let us have what? Anything. <laughs> and why does God say no to our prayers? For exactly the same reason that the father says no to the child. Because the father knows better. He knows that what the child thinks would make him happy is going to make him sick. Or it's going to make him miserable. There's always a reason, but the point I'm making is, do you trust God's wisdom? Do you trust him to give you what you need when you need it? That's the lesson in trust. My God shall supply all your need. I have so many illustrations that I'm always collecting of, of who this God is. Of course, we have the whole scripture that describes his relationships with men and women and angels and creatures. And we live on the coast of Massachusetts and have been out a number of times to see whales. And to me, that's one of the most exciting things, the most thrilling sights I've ever seen in my life. More than once, I have seen what they call a breach, which is when the entire whale comes straight up out of the water. And in one case, he did it three times spinning. So they called it a triple spinning breach. And believe you me, when 60,000 pounds of humpback whale hits the water, it makes a splash. <laughs> to go from that to this. Let me give you some facts about some creatures. Do you know what are the most vital plants on earth? Some of you probably do. I certainly didn't until I read an article about them. They, the, they can some, sometimes survive 150 years of drought. They provide more food than any other living thing. And what else? Before I tell you what they are, they swim and dig. These are plants. Anybody know what they are? It's something called diatoms. The word atom is on the end with D-I on the front. Diatoms. They are one-celled specks of algae in the shapes of, get this, pinwheels, spirals, stars, triangles, chandeliers, discs, rods, ovals, and there are 25,000 species of diatoms, the most vital plants on Earth. The largest is one millimeter, and a humpback whale, this same whale that I was telling you about that weighs from 60,000 to over 100,000 pounds, eats several hundred billion diatoms every few hours. And that's what a humpback whale lives on, these one meter one millimeter creatures. And a German by the name of J.D. Muller spent 15 years mounting on a microscopic slide, one slide. He spent 15 years mounting 4,000 diatoms on that slide. Now, does that give you an, any idea of who God is? He's also the one that runs the galaxies, the one who made the stars, and it says that with such laconic 
expression in the first chapter of Genesis. You know, he just he made the sun and the moon and he made the earth and he made the animals. And then there's just that little laconic word in there, and he made the stars, as if some, one day with the back of his hand he just created the stars. And if I had time, I'd go into the most staggering thing I've just learned about one of those stars that I'd never even heard of before, but I haven't got time for all that this morning. Um, I'm just trying to raise your sights a little bit. Do you think that the God who keeps the galaxies exactly where they belong and runs the planets and the stars and all of that and created these microscopic creatures of which there are 25,000 different species in the forms of chandeliers and discs, etc. Do you just think that maybe, perhaps, possibly, he might be able to run your life a little bit better than you do? Is that a possibility? But you know, we, we don't really believe that some of the time. When we want what we want and we're afraid God's not going to give it to us, it's because we really don't have confidence that God knows what he's doing. He's not really paying attention to me. Poor little me, you know, I was behind the door when they handed out all the talents and I can't do anything and nobody likes me. And as my mother used to sing to us when we had that attitude, uh, nobody loves me, everybody hates me, guess I'll go out and eat worms. Nice, fat, squashy ones, long, thin, gooey ones, guess I'll go out and eat worms. <laughs> and of course we were not allowed to carry on very much on that line of things. But if the foundation of our confidence is God himself, then it ought to make a tremendous difference in our lives and in the way we behave and in the way we say our prayers and in the way we rejoice in everything that happens, everything, because nothing ever happens to us that is not under God's control, nothing. So the first thing is to think about who he is. And the second thing, what he does. And again, in that verse in Isaiah 43, one, he says, I have formed thee, I have called thee by thy name, I have redeemed thee. He's the one who made you, he's the one who calls you by name, he is the one who gave himself to redeem you. And he says, you are mine. Is that wonderful or what? It's just a great thing for us to go back when, in that moment when it just seems as though everything has collapsed, go back and think, who is this? that I belong to, who is Lord of my life. So does my confidence rest primarily in what he does? My confidence rests primarily in who he is. If I know who he is, then I know that what he does is without exception, good, right, loving, and wise. Everything that God does is good, right, loving, and wise. And what is it that God is up to in your life and mine? What is God's purpose in our lives? Got the exact answer I wanted right here. He conform us to the image of Christ. He wants to shape us into the image of his son, because that's what Romans 8.29 tells us. Everything that happens fits into the pattern of good, and the pattern is the shaping of this human being, this man, this woman, this boy, this girl, into the image of Christ. He wants to make us like him. Now, you know what an image is. Suppose we think of a statue. What does it take to make a statue? Well, you start with a block of marble, and I guess it was Michelangelo himself that said, all you, it's very simple, all you do is take a block of mar marble and you knock off what you don't want. <laughs> but it takes a hammer. It takes hammer blows. It takes a, a chisel. It takes the chipping of the chisel. And it takes a file. Now, many of the things in our lives may seem like hammer blows. There aren't usually that many things, but... All you need is one to make you real and think, what can God possibly be up to in allowing this terrible thing to happen to me? That's a hammer blow, but then most of us experience very many chippings of the chisel. 
God has to chip and chip and chip in order to shape us into the image of Christ. And then every day there is the rasping of the file to get those sharp corners and sharp edges off. So you can think about which are the hammer blows in your life, which are the chippings of the chisel, and probably my guess would be that the raspings of the file come from somebody you have to get along with somewhere. Maybe at home, or maybe at work, or maybe that impossible woman in your church who never ought to have been in the committee in the first place. <laughs> it's the rasping of the file. Why does God put us through this? Because he's making an image. He is shaping Elizabeth Elliot into the image of Christ. And what it takes to shape me into the image of Christ takes a different set of hammer blows than what it takes to make you. And only God knows. And there'd be no two of us who would take the same process to make us into his image. But of course, it, it always involves suffering of some sort. Let's never be surprised. The Apostle Peter, in his letter to the exiles, he said, don't be surprised at the things that have happened in your life. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that is to try you, as though some strange thing happened. Have you ever actually said to God, why me? What have I done to deserve this? Of course, if you stop and really think, you've done a whole lot of things to deserve a whole lot worse than what you got, right? If you and I were to get what we deserve, we'd be in huge trouble. We really should be saying, why not me? Jesus suffered. Who do I think I am? John the Baptist, the most faithful servant, had his head chopped off. Who do I think I am? Stephen was stoned to death. Who do I think I am? Oh, yes, but they were the great saints of the Bible. Look, God wants to make a few great saints out of the people in Douglas, Wyoming. And if we would be willing to submit to the hammer and the chisel and the file without being so surprised and so depressed and so self-pitying, it would change the whole of the Western Plains, wouldn't it? I believe that. God's love is inexhaustible. He wills to make us holy. He is able to save. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above what we ask or think. He is able to keep us from falling. He is able to do all that needs to be done. And he is wise and he loves us with an everlasting love. I receive much mail from radio listeners and some from people who read my books. And many people expect me to be like Dear Abby and ex be able to answer all their questions and solve all their problems just like that. And of course, the more I read of them, the more I realize that all the problems, most of them so wildly different from anything I have ever experienced. In fact, I've often said, I, when I read these letters, I feel as if I've never had a problem in my life. I don't know what trouble is. But as I pray over them and ponder them and think, what in the world am I going to say to this woman who comes to me and tells me some horror story about what her son is into? Um, I've never been in that situation. What am I supposed to say? So I, I began trying to just crystallize some things so that I could write at least part of a form letter to send to just about everybody because it seems to me that these all come down to the same thing. Will you leave it in God's hands? Will you put it in God's hands? Will you trust him for the outcome? Will you let God handle what you can't handle? And one of the things that we women have got to learn that we cannot handle is our husbands. Now, we're not supposed to be handling in the sense of running their lives. And I don't suppose there's a woman in the world that doesn't have a few things, few maybe tiny little suggestions that she'd like to make in her husband's life. You know, the old uh, musical, My Fair Lady, there's a song in there that says, let a woman in your life and your serenity is through. She'll redecorate your home from the cellar to the dome, and then she'll go on to the enthralling fun of overhauling you. <laughs> she'll have a booming, boisterous family that descends on to you D descends on you en masse, she'll have a large Wagnerian mother with a voice that shatters glass. 
We all have things we'd like to be able to change, and we can't do it. You cannot change your husband. I've tried with three of them. <laughs> and they, are all, they were all very, very different, believe me. Numbers one and numbers two were nothing like Lars Grin, except in two things that I can think of. Number one, well, let's see, I can think of more than two. Number one, they were Christians. Number two, they were masculine, and they were glad to be men, and I was glad to have them be men. We need to go back to a time when women were women, and men were glad of it, and and the third thing was they all liked me. So, I mean, they had that much in common, but nothing else that I can think of. So these are, here is one of the quotations that I want to send to everybody and shout it from the housetops because it covers everything. It says in one paragraph all the things that I will be saying here today and tomorrow morning. This is from an Englishman who lived during the 19th century. His name was E.B. Pusey. He said, this then is of faith that everything, the very least, or what seems to us great, every change of the seasons, everything which touches us in mind, body, or estate, whether bought, brought about through this outward senseless nature, a drought or a flood or whatever, or by the will of man, what that terrible person did to you that you can never forgive, good or bad, is overruled to each of us, overruled to each of us by the all-holy and all-loving will of God. Everything which touches us is overruled to each of us. I see he's not saying God inspired the Indians to spear your husband. God gave my second husband cancer. He is simply saying these, these are wicked things. The fact that Jesus was nailed to a cross by wicked men, that was an evil deed. Was it overruled by God? Not only to his son Jesus, but to all the rest of us? You and I wouldn't be here, would we, if it weren't for that terrible deed, which was the crucifixion. So God knows how to transform, and that's not the end of the quotation from Dr. Pusey. Whatever befalls us, however it bef whatever befalls us, however it befalls us, we must receive as the will of God. Yes, Lord. If it befalls us through man's negligence or ill will or anger, Still it is, in every least circumstance, to us the will of God. Now, do you understand the mystery that we're talking about here? We can't fathom the mystery, and we can't harmonize it intellectually, but it is a matter of faith. God allowed this to happen. There's no question whatsoever in my mind that God allowed my first husband to be killed by Indian spears. He was a good man. He was doing what was God's will. Why was John the Baptist beheaded? Because he did God's will. But it was an evil king, an adulterous woman, and a silly dancing girl who were the human instruments in his getting his head chopped off and brought in on a platter. Horrible thing. Did God allow it to happen? He did. It is in every least circumstance to us the will of God, for if, this is the reason, for if the least thing could happen to us without God's permission, it would be something out of God's control. God's providence or his love would not be what they are. Almighty God himself would not be the same God, not the God whom we believe, adore, love, trust, and obey. Now to me, that is an answer for every problem anywhere that anybody's got, if we would really believe that. Now there's nobody in this room that doesn't have something in your life that you consider painful, something that you would like to change, but you can't. It's something about which you can do nothing. 
Maybe it's the place you live. Maybe it's the job that you have. Maybe it's the amount of money that you have now. Maybe it's the people you have to work with. Maybe it's a physical problem, spiritual problem, emotional problem. Whatever it is, you can't change it. Not all by yourself, anyway. It may be something that God wants to change sometime, but it might be something God does not want to change. You know, we can't be sure that God wants to change things. And let me tell you the story of Amy Carmichael. When she was just a little girl, she was about three years old, and she was told by her godly parents that God answers prayer. Now, this little three-year-old girl trusted the word of her parents, as she should. And so she believed that God would answer her prayer, and that there was one thing that she wanted more than anything else in the world, which was blue eyes. She had dark brown eyes, and she wanted blue ones. So she got down beside her bed one night, and she prayed that God would give her blue eyes. And without any question, when she woke up in the morning, she knew that God would have done it. So she couldn't wait to push the chair over to the dresser and climb up so she could look into the mirror. And, of course, she looked into the same brown eyes. And she told this story years later to her hundreds of Indian children when she was a missionary in India. And she said she really didn't remember whether God had actually spoken the words to her or whether some adult had spoken these words. But the answer came to her, isn't no an answer? God answers prayer. And sometimes the answer is no. She could never have dreamed at the age of three that someday she would be a missionary in India and that there would be occasions on which her life would depend on her being taken for an Indian. She had very dark hair. She always wore the sari. She went barefoot. But if she had had blue eyes, she would have been spotted as a foreigner from 50 feet away at least. So God knows what he's doing, doesn't he? Sometimes he shows us later on why something happened. In my experience, he doesn't very often show us. He doesn't give us explanations. He's just saying, I know what I'm doing. Trust me, I'm working on a pattern. Do you have confidence in God? Do you have a solid, immovable, rock-solid foundation to that confidence? The foundation is God himself, the character of God. The dog trusted the character of the master. You and I are servants of a master. Do we trust him? Do we really believe that he's wise and loving and powerful? Another place where my found the foundation of my confidence cannot rest, the play, I haven't given you one and two, the point number one was who he is, and point number two is what he does. And he calls us to live and walk and participate with him. But my foundation must not be in my nature, whether it be optimism and robust vitality, or an attitude of self-assertion, or being told to take charge of our lives. We hear an awful lot of baloney these days, that we are supposed to learn to say no to other people and yes to ourselves, uh, self-assertion, uh, taking charge of our lives, empowerment is one of the words everybody loves. Uh, a true Christian is told that we are to abandon ourselves, to give up our right to ourselves. Now, just let me ask you a very simple question. Is it possible for you to be working on improving your self-image while you are at the same time laying down your right to yourself, which is what Jesus said we have to do if we want to be his disciples. I don't see any way to do that. And I figure that if I were to work on my self-image, it would probably be a full-time job for the rest of my life. And I don't think it would make a whole lot of difference. I'd much rather take on as my full-time job learning to know God and working on being conformed to the image of Christ. So let's not be taken in by the disease which has become an epidemic across our country of self-culture, a comfortable smugness 
as opposed to the fear of God. I think there is an especially grave danger now in minimizing our defects or despairing because of our sin. It's strange that the same thing can be in the same person because our secular thinking and secular culture is constantly telling us to minimize our defects. Don't be hard on yourself. You know, that wasn't really sin. You just had a bad background or your father did this to you or your mother didn't do that or something that somebody else did or this crumb bum that you were working with has embezzled all your funds and so this is why you're just helpless. God is always in charge of everything and my foundation does not rest on my education or my degrees or my personality or my nature or anything else. I'm not clinging to my selfhood or my self-consciousness. I love what Goethe, the German philosopher, said, only God knows who I am and may God preserve me from ever finding out. <laughs> and you remember what Peter thought of himself when he realized who Christ was. He said, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And when Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up so that his train filled the temple and the very posts of the doors shook with the presence of that holiness, what did Isaiah say? I need to work on my self-image. He said, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amidst a people of unclean lips. The foundation of my confidence is God himself, the character of God himself. Another illustration that made a deep impression in my life as when I was a brand new grandmother. My little first grandson was maybe a year and a half old or so and we were in the car with his father and his father decided it was time to take the car through the car wash. And this was one of those automatic car washes which can be rather a frightening experience for anybody on the first run through. And this little boy had never been through a car wash and he was too young to have anything explained to him. So as the car was drawn into this dark tunnel I looked at his face, and those big blue eyes got bigger, and I could see the fear in his eyes as he looked around at the darkness and strange things that started to happen, and his eyes went immediately to the face of his father. And then, of course, the roar of the water came down on four sides of the car, and again, the fear, he looked around, and his eyes went back to the face of his father. And then there was the banging of the brushes and the roaring and the, the great rubber thing that came crashing down onto the windshield and one thing after another. It was as if we were in some kind of, of a horror movie and there was no possibility that we were ever going to get out. And this little boy had no way of knowing why we were going through this <laughs> or how we were ever going to get out, if ever. But you know, he never cried. Although the fear was there, there's a verse in the Psalms that says, what time I am afraid, I will trust. And that little boy never cried. He was afraid, but he knew his father. And he knew that he could trust his father. His father had never given him reason to mistrust him. A solemn lesson for fathers. Have you given your son or your daughter any reason ever to mistrust you? Probably you have at some point. You need to apologize. You need to confess it. Don't be afraid to let your children know that you know you're a sinner. My father had a great temper. And I think when we had our last reunion here in Cody, the three younger ones in the family, of whom my brother Jim Howard is one, said they really hadn't seen the evidence of that temper because my father brought it under the lordship of Jesus Christ. We three older children saw it. We were not physically abused, except that there were a couple of times when I think he apologized to my oldest brother because he felt he had spanked him too hard. And there were times when the punishments my mother felt were a little bit too hard. I remember being sent to bed one night without any supper by my father. And my mother sneaked up later with a little bowl of porridge or something. It wasn't very good, but it was something to go to sleep on. But anyway... 
the point that I'm making is it's a good thing for your children to recognize your fallibility and your humility before God in acknowledging those. And my father did apologize to us and asked us to pray that the Lord would give him victory over his out-of-control temper. And the Lord did that to the point where the three younger children didn't remember anything about it. It's a great lesson. It's one your children will never forget. But of course our effort should be directed toward faithfulness in the example that we set. Because what you are and what you do is a thousand times more important than anything you'll ever say. The child wants to do what the daddy does. He stands and watches you shave. He wants to shave too. He puts his feet in your shoes. He wants to walk in your footsteps in the snow. And he is going to follow you. It should be sobering and solemnizing. And who of us is up to that? The day my daughter was born, I was just overwhelmed with the sense of responsibility, realizing here is a human being in this world for whom nobody is responsible except Jim and me. And I'm her mother. And I said, Lord, I'll never make it. I can never mother this tiny little package that we've got here the way she ought to be mothered. Give me grace. Help me, Lord. I'll never make it through a year. And I looked at my nurse who had seven children, and I thought she's made it through not only seven years, but I mean seven children, but seven deliveries. How does anybody ever live through the second one? God is faithful, and my confidence lies in who he is. The dog knew the master. My grandson knew his father. And I know my heavenly father. And it is not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy that he saved us. Now, I want to say just a few more things about this self-esteem disease, because I find that it is pervasive across this country. Many of the letters that I receive describe the distortions that people have been given by modern psychiatry, and they pay big money to get this kind of counseling. The Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. And I think there's an awful lot of so-called Christian counseling which is ungodly. I want to warn you against it. Now, don't go out of here and say Elizabeth Elliot is against all Christian counseling. She is not. But I do want to say this. Try God. First, did you call up 39 of your closest friends when a disaster hit you? And then you went and talked to your poor overworked pastor who didn't charge you $100 an hour. And when you gave up on your 39 friends and your pastor and your husband and everybody else that was willing to listen to your story, then you go and pay big money to somebody who poses as a Christian counselor who dis does not necessarily base what he says on the cross and on Jesus Christ. And if you have been counseled by somebody who doesn't start at the foot of the cross and with the nature of man, which is sinful, and with the character of God, you have been ripped off. Jesus warns us not to seek the approval of men. How can we then defend the altogether foolish notion that we owe it to ourselves to rise in the world, to be upwardly mobile, to seek fulfillment, self-satisfaction, or even distinction. When Amy Carmichael was offered a royal reward from Queen Victoria for her services, she graciously declined. Her answer was, to have peace, one must forget himself. And to forget himself, one must walk in truth. She did not wish, I, I don't think she put that part in the letter, but in the notes that she wrote for her family at the time, she said, in, I believe that she said in the letter of response, that it troubled her to be honored in a way in which her Lord was never honored. And I cannot imagine the Lord Jesus ever encouraging anybody to work on building up his self-esteem or his self-image or to actualize himself. If we're really honest, 
our self-image is going to be pretty poor, isn't it? Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. May our confidence rest in his character, nobody else's. God bless you. I pray you've been encouraged and inspired by what you've heard today. And will keep joining us here and on social media for my granny's inspiration. Until then, remember, the eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms.